In this video, we're going to travel all the way out to the middle of nowhere in Ireland to get elbow deep in some guts. This one is likely to get more disturbingly brutal than you would expect. We open in a dense forest where you know something is up. The atmosphere alone is enough to make the back of your neck tingle. We then enter a dilapidated old dairy farm that apparently is still functional. A layer of mystique is then peeled back as a modest Geo Metro just rolls right up and into the property. Orla is driving it, and her arrival is observed by Dan, a sneaky little son of a gun. He reports out that their prize Holstein's been tucked away in the shed all day. Orla lubes up her prophylactic to commence with an examination of the old girl's steaming bunghole. She's coming along just fine as her water has broken, but then the cheeky little calfling snip snaps her hand. She's not hurt though, just startled. Dan then takes a moment to approach a nearby caravan and formally announce to these van life vloggers that they're not welcome on the property. But actually, as Jamie, the old knobhead, pedantically points out, they're not on his property. This is an easement. Nevertheless, Dan gives them until the following day to vacate. Inside, Mary insists they remain stationary until the roads are clear of the people who may be looking for them. When Dan gets back, Orla has returned to the farm with their benefactor, John. As he checks the ultrasound, and Orla gets up to her elbow in some cow guts, it's revealed that John may have a funding issue here as he's been pretty slow with the paychecks. But then their payload comes into view and things seem to be okay. Orla presses him for more info on what their ultimate goal is, because something in there snapped at her. But he insists that the calf they're in appears as a normal calf. And then he retires to his research. In the farmhouse, Dan laments his decision to lease his property for their little experiment, especially with the slow trickle of funding, as now he has to bear the pain of working daily with his ex-girlfriend, sans compensation. The afternoon passes without incident, and the moon soon arrives to greet us as Jamie keeps a constant vigil for their pursuers. Later on, Dean is roused by sounds of animal distress. He arrives at the barn to find Bessie poop and blood, so he immediately lathers up and gets out the calf winch to see if he can extricate that naughty little booger, pausing only to gather up a pail of warm water. Jamie and Mary awake to intermittent lights flashing, and thinking the heat is on, burst forth to get down with it. But it's just bloody Dan looking for some heifer assistance. Recognizing these young city twats are too soft and mushy, he leaves them to attend to his business. But once their nerves settle a bit, they recognize that administering assistance might help to buy them some time. By the time Jamie arrives, Dan is already cranking on that uterine clamp and is surely happy for the help. Jamie removes his jacket and jewelry, and the boys get in there and do what they can to keep the old girl comfortable while still retaining access to the inextricably difficult birthling. We observe the scene, ropes taut, sweat glycerin, muscles twitching, teeth grinding, until they finally knock something loose and get that calf sliding out like a torpedo. Finding it not breathing and unresponsive, Dan employs a little maneuver of bovine resuscitation. And despite appearances, it works. Although when he tries to pry open its little chompers, the young calf proves hesitant to reveal its secrets. They rush inside for a pot of warm water and some iodine, and Dan plunges his mangled meat hook into the concoction until it stops sizzling. Back in the barn, Mary has arrived to see if the boys needed any jammy dodgers or jaffa cakes, but only finds a cute baby animal. Who could resist. Her nurturing is interrupted by the men, who find her rearing foreign and alarming, so much so that Jamie suggests they put the beast out of its misery. The thing clearly ain't right, but Dan has contractual obligations to fulfill, so he recommends they all just turn in for the night. Oh, and also, stay as long as you like. Score. Orla rolls up later to find Dan fell victim to the cow's natural instinct to kill. They only grow docile after puberty, you know. She tries to alert John that it's gone wonky, but she can't get a good signal. Instead, she makes an executive decision, but her hesitation results in a last-minute twitch that causes a misfire, riling up the mama. Before they can wrangle the calf for the old double tap, Bessie pulls an impressive gainer over the stall boards, requiring Orla to use the next charge on her for their own safety. Now that things are nice and quiet and they have some time, they let the calf go peacefully into the night. Orla needs to straighten some things out, so they hoist the young calf onto the shop table where she works to evacuate its abdominal cavity. She notes a congenital condition that causes enlarged organs, and also that it has some extra bits that shouldn't be there. They look like some cool jewelry you might buy at the beach, but what they actually are are a series of malformed cow fetuses. The kind with bones on the outside, you know? Crimes against nature? They could never.
Except nature finds a way. She reveals that the point of the project was to create cows that could breed younger to increase the stock, but they were not expecting bovunculi. She warns him to hold tight and keep them separated from the other animals and stuff. You know, in case of possible infection and whatnot. Then she rushes off to go check on some things. Certainly none of them would get very far by morning, little cow shrimp that they are. The next morning, all seems quiet. The kids are earning their keep, checking on Dan's hand and offering to feed the cattle. Dan gets patched up but wants to wait for Orla to return before leaving for the hospital. Through conversation, we learn that the visitors are hiding from some interfamilial strife as Mary's brothers are looking to get their hands on Jamie, who at that moment is laying some feed for the cows and wandering around to make believe like he's a farmer boy. He finds out that if you want to raise cows, you have to be ready to get damp because cows love swamps. He discovers that one of them has a series of open wounds on its legs, and as he walks back, he gets some open wounds on his legs as well. Dan's not sure what to think, but he's very concerned for his cows. Before making heads or tails of it, Garda Hurrigan pulls up to warn Dan about the caravan out front. If he lets the gadabouts in, they're likely to put down roots and force him off his property. Oh, and less pressing, but Orla's car was found about a mile up the road. Since they didn't find Orla with it, she is presumed to be okay. After he leaves, Dan offers them to take cover from the road in the safety of his barn. While there, he notices a stall is now unlocked and finds evidence that Orla had been there and played around with Bessie's insides. Mary? Burn us. Get rid of us. Mary's got some solid advice. Very soon, the whole place is wafting with the succulent aroma of roasted meats. That evening, the rains roll in and bring John with them. Dan shows John the final outcome of his really great experiment and explains that Orla is missing and seemed feverish when she left. The boys head out to the lab and are surprised to find the specimen has expunged a volume of fresh innards, prompting John to kick Dan out so he can have some alone time with his creations. Under the microscope, he finds the cells are still replicating, but way too fast, like a hyperbacteria, although it's probably nothing to be concerned with. John goes back through the ultrasound frame by frame and discovers what looks an awful lot like a fully formed entity that appears ready to nom on something. On a somewhat related note, we find the lovebirds wrapping up a Session of awkward intercourse. It's not typical and Jamie blames his performance on his bum foot. Couldn't get traction, you know? Plus the farm smell, there's still a lot going on. Although, as we see later, this may be the result of the farm coming to them as a slimy little slug trail leads to the bed, and Mary is jolted awake by a recently born calfling trying to find a new home. John and Dan scope things out but don't find anything, but that doesn't mean he doesn't know what it was. One of the six sisters has escaped. This is unfortunate because if it escapes the farm and finds some cows, there could be millions of them in no time. As a result, John initiates a strict quarantine protocol. Then the boys go to where Jamie got bit and presume the little critter to be trapped in the mud somewhere. Dan tries to drive his tractor deep into the slurry to flush it out, but luckily for our pleasure, he goes a bit too deep. He has to come back through the murky waters, which is a harrowing ordeal for even the most experienced dairy farmer, and it is made worse by the discovery of Orla's soggy corpse. In the lab, John finds evidence that she has been occupied, if you will, and also evacuated many times. He explores her cavity and finds her mostly hollowed out like a jack-o'-lantern. His assumption is that the creature moved on when her body grew cold in the frigid slurry. He finds evidence that confirms its presence and takes a small sample that indicates there are human cells mixed up in there. Just to confirm his worst fears, he feeds it and watches as it corrupts his cells as it grows. This leads him to conclude that it will spread infection to humans. So if it got out into the general population, the birth defects down the road would be off the charts. Jamie, not one to pull out, becomes aghast at the dawning of these realizations as John tries to get a look at his little piggies. A struggle ensues and Jamie gets the upper hand, but makes the mistake of turning his back on a scorned mad doctor. In the end, John asks him if he can hold on to his bolt for a second. Inside, Dan is confiding his suspicion that something is seriously wrong, but they are distracted by sounds of distress. They venture out to find John deep in a pile of cow viscera, noting the subject is growing quickly. It's tucking into various cows to feast on their insides before blasting out. While Mary goes to find Jamie, the others proceed straight to what they presume to be the host cow. John has no hesitation about jumping in with the execution and exploration. He was built for this stuff. 
but Dan has hit his daily limit for cow trauma and outwardly recognizes John's tendencies toward evil. John doesn't really disprove this when he attempts to blast Dan in the face to prevent the spread of the infection. Mary sees this and is able to slip away, but still thinks she's trying to find Jamie. This slows her down, but she does find him at any rate. John prepares to put her down, but his hand is stayed by the recognition that the subject may be nearby. He then falls victim to the customary evisceration of the father. Mary runs off and finds Dan. They go back to find the foul beast as a team and catch it sliding under the floorboards. Dan, having nothing left to milk, attempts to pursue so he may exact revenge for what's left of his farm. But his injuries make it hard to get under, so Mary steps up to do what must be done. She gets down there and starts rooting around until she finds a potential target, but soon sees that this sucker is squirting out monster babies all over the place. She takes out the host and then starts squishing the rest of them. This gets the mama angry, sending her scrambling for safety and urgently requesting some assistance. In response, Dan fires up the machinery, which creates a distraction right as Mary's being cornered. It ends up working, allowing her the luxury of finding her way topside. She runs across Dan, who had to sit down for a minute because his tummy hurts. When the creature jumps on him, she is able to repel it and, after a brief struggle, eventually manages to get it mangled up in the mechanics. She loads Dan up, but with his dying words, he reminds her, there is that, but he passes, leaving her to sort out this moral quandary on her own. And with little background available to us, it's hard to know what she chose. Until we flash forward to four months later and find ourselves in a maternity ward. Mary is here, keeping her fingers crossed for an unremarkable ultrasound. It's a go. What a joy. Well, that was brutal, but if you're looking to go deeper than that, be sure to check out this video next. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.